We good? Yep, you're good. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, we are going to be live streaming today, and I'm just finishing up the marketing as usual. And as everyone's joining, if you could state where you are from or where you're watching this from, and we'll do a quick shout out to you guys as we begin the stream here. Got to test. Then we will get started. Oof. It should be a good one, I think. The uh, painting in orange. Mm hmm. Joys. Okay, and one more. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Tim Von Rieden with cgcookie.com, and I'm joined by Joe Chico. Hello. And today we are doing our Wednesday live stream that we do every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, and that's minus 5 GMT. And uh, usually we post the subject matter an hour or two beforehand. Usually it'll relate to the exercise. As in today's stream's case, we are going to be drawing the orange. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, go check out exercise 39 on Concept Cookie, and you can download your practice sheet. And today I'm going to be doing one of the four fruit that was assigned for the exercise. And the exercise is mainly focused on uh, isolated highlights and the importance of them. Because with really well-placed and accurate-looking highlights, it can really change the overall appearance of the texture of the material that you're working with. And this one in specific because there's that fine line between something looking plastic or something looking fleshy or pulpy. And we're going to go for the pulpy and hopefully not the plastic. And uh, some other things that are happening right now. Uh, we, I'm currently in the process of making brushes that you can download, so a, a whole new brush pack. And I've already done about, I think I'm at 13 right now. But if there's one that you've been dying to get your hands on, like if you really wanted a specific brush and you can't find it on the internet, or maybe you did, but it didn't really work out for you, let me know during this live stream and in the comments, maybe put like brushes dash and then put your brush suggestion so that's easier for Joe to see. And then I will make sure to write them down because hopefully either tomorrow or Friday, I will release the new brush pack and uh, you can download it then. All right, I think that's most of the announcements. And then if you are in the Chicago area next weekend, Joe and I will be at C2E2 along with some of our art buddies, and you can meet us there if you are in the area. All right, I'm ready to do this. Are you ready, Joe? Yep. All right, so as I'm switching over, let's do our shout-outs. All right. I'm also updating the uh, community post. So uh, right now we have greetings from Washington. From Faith Newman. Hello, Faith. Hello. Uh, Sydney Kruger says hello from Phoenix, Arizona. Sean Diamond says hello from Virginia. And Andrea? Andrea? Hi, greetings from Denmark. Ren hello. Ren I don't think I'm saying this right. Renato uh, from Italy. Horatio from Mexico, Morningstar from Moscow, Tom Artists from the UK, I Am Not is from Sweden, Okra is from Florida, and Luis, Luis is here, Luis, Hampton, Hampson, Sam, uh, from Wales. Awesome. Okay figure out my brush configuration and we'll go ahead and get started and then oh sorry. oh sorry i was gonna say andrew andrew says hello hello and oh mckinney you, yeah and i bet you d brown's here too probably <laughs> <laughs> oh he is there he is um i wanted uh oh, what was i gonna say shoot i interrupted you sorry no yeah uh, <laughs> i should be have I should have a better memory than that. I'm sure it'll come to me eventually. All right. Anyways. Oh, yeah. Okay. So as always, if you have questions about 
not only what I'm working on specifically, so the orange, if you have any questions about digital art or something about uh, maybe learning or art school, is it worth it? Like That's usually a question we get. Any question that you have that's on your mind that is relatable to digital art or concept art or being an artist, anything like that, feel free to ask it. Or maybe if you're feeling like you want a funny question, we always throw some of those in there as well. And I always enjoy seeing some of those. All right, so first, when I look at this, I want a solid base. I want a solid foundation to work on. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new layer underneath of the, let's see where the outline layer is, right there. So make a new layer under there so that when I lay a color, I can still see the outline underneath. Now for my outline, I usually work darker and then I build up my lights, but for this one I'm going to work a little differently. I'm going to work with, I think, well, I'm going to work with two foundation colors because I feel like the yellow and the orange are so strong where the, that yellow rim kind of encapsulates the orange. So I'm going to first lay down the yellow. And then actually I'm going to zoom in so you can see this better. Make my reference smaller too. And then on the exercise, so you can download this P PSD and then I have a color palette in the corner or if you just want to color pick from the reference itself. I would recommend just trying to pick from the color palette so you can get used to just seeing a limited amount of colors and then it's not as overwhelming as looking at the orange and thinking of how many hundreds of little nuances of orange there are in it. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to make that yellow a little darker. And then I'm going to make one more new layer on top of that. I'm going to grab, say, this orange. I'm going to fill in the rest. I'm going to use my eraser tool to erase the excess here. As I do that, now we could do a few questions here. Questions? All right. What is the best digital art book that you could recommend from Dave T? And that's a tough one. Uh, that's digital art book. The one that we got recently, hold on. Let me go. I forgot the specific title, but it was really, really good for beginners. I think it was digital art for beginners, or Photoshop for beginners, I think is what it's called. Uh, I think Charlie Bowwater's featured in that one. Oh, did you did you go get the book? Yeah, <laughs> I was like, where did you, where did you go? Um, okay, hold on. I'm gonna share my screen really quick so I can show you the book. All right, so this is it. It's called Art Fundamentals, and it covers color, light, composition, anatomy, perspective, and depth. And I'm there's a bunch of really good like art of books that I would recommend, like the Final Fantasy 14 or Bravely Default or The Last of Us. I thought were like perfect in terms of that subject matter and the, the content. But if you're looking for like a strictly digital art painting book, I would say this one was probably the best one I found so far. Now there's a few that like cover specific topics like Color and Light by James Gurney, which everyone knows and recommends. That one's really good. And uh, if you're looking specifically for like anatomy, there's definitely anatomy books that I think are better than this one. But if you really want that in that whole digital art realm, I think that's a good book to check out. Micah Tisdale asks, Tim, do you use real pictures to paint people? How do you go about picking the colors to paint him? To paint real people? <laughs> uh, I have... Let me see if I can find it really quick. Because as always, I think reference is such a great thing to use, and you'd be hindering yourself if you were like stubborn and were like, I'm not going to use reference because I can do it on my own. You don't want that attitude. 
Okay, so here's my PSD of skin reference. And I usually color pick, oops, wait, right there. So I usually will pick from this palette or if I don't just pick from my swatches that I have on the side. And I try not to limit myself. So while I'm working, I'll be like, okay, in this cheek area, I need a reddish flesh, fleshy tone. So then I'll quickly look at my reference. I'll like as fast as I can scan all my references. And then as soon as I see one that I'm like, that's the one that I, I want. Like, let's say it was this one down here on this woman's cheek. I'll call somewhere in that region and then go back to my drawing and continue. So it's not such a strict, like, meticulous, I have to follow step one, two, three with skin because that's where I, I sometimes get overwhelmed with it, like almost with being a perfectionist and that hurts me because then I, I usually waste a lot of time or everything looks so similar that it's not fun at that point. And I don't think you should limit yourself to like one skin palette. I think you'll find that you should open it up to multiple and have fun experimenting with trusting yourself and being like, okay, I have a bunch of references over here. Now when I need a specific color, I know that I can go, go to this and pull from it. Actually, I changed my mind. I'm going to do one solid base color. I'm going to change that. The next, the next question is from Okra. It says, how do you decide personally on what you feel like drawing or sketching out when you have so many different ideas or concepts either in your mind or things around you from your life you want to draw, such as people or objects? Great question. I think for I, not only me, I think for most artists, we get like new ideas every day. And usually those ideas don't actually come to fruition. Like they just get lost and they'll never get drawn. So the way I always I think about it, and my coworker Kent, if you know him from Blender Cookie, he gave me the best advice, is when you're passionate about something or when you're thinking about something, you come up with a new idea and you're excited about it, do it. Do that right at that day or whatever because the next day or the next two days, you'll find something new that you're excited about and that old idea will just go on the back burner forever. And you'll be frustrated probably at how many back burner drawings you have that you'll never get to. And that's okay. No, no, I'm saying, oh, actually, no, that's not okay. It's good to have new ideas every day and like you're constantly feeding off of new inspirations. What's not okay is never taking action on those ideas. So for your question, let's say you're really excited about drawing a bush that you saw outside or something. Draw that bush that day. And trust me, it'll be so much easier to draw as you go rather than it is to try to pull from like things you had an idea of like months ago because you might not be as passionate about that idea anymore and then the result might not be as good. Okay, I also need to be conscious of making new layers because I need to make the the final exercise step by step, like the berry one, and I want to make sure that you capture all of them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sydney Kruger says, I'm having to paint and draw lots of mushrooms. Any tips for painting fungus textures? Uh, maybe on the next stream. Because I could show you, but I, I really want to make sure I get this orange done in the next hour and 15 minutes. So I got to focus on it. But the best thing you can do, use reference. And uh, even The Last of Us, I thought, did like a phenomenal job of taking fungus and modernizing it and making it almost their own. And just look at the way that they use their shapes. Think about the texture and the material. Don't over-speculate it. There's no reason for a whole bunch of highlights on a mushroom. That doesn't really make sense unless it just rained or something. And be very conscious of color. And you can kind of play with the gradients and the transition from the top of the shroom to the bottom. And uh, the like 
sometimes the griminess or the dirtiness of it. So maybe like add some of that wear and tear to the mushroom to give it that environmental factor as well. Oh, and if any of you are wondering, I'm currently using the skin brush to do this part of the orange. I just wanted a brush that wasn't as flat as the rounder soft edge brush and I wanted uh, some texture along with it. Uh, Harisha says, hi guys, how's it going? One topic that's of my interest, specular shine on wet surfaces. Could you make an example and give a little explanation? Thanks. Yes, just stay tuned for like the final part of this live stream because that's when I'll do all the, the final highlights on the orange itself. Because it's, those are very important, so. I don't want you to rush into doing highlights if you're, what you're working on isn't ready for the highlights yet. It's almost like being patient. It's like waiting for your gift on Christmas or something. Like if you can just wait it out, it'll be so much more worth it than if you try to add it and then work around the highlight. Like it, it's not as, I guess, easy to work with if you add highlights too early. I'm a Freeman asks, while painting this orange, are you using lower opacity brush or layer? I am using a brush that has transfer on, but I keep my opacity at 100%, and then the layer is at 100% too. Now, mind you, this is how I paint. I, I've seen a lot of painters that use like a 50 to 70% opacity on their brush, and then they'll work it up that way. So I guess try both ways and see what feels best for you. and. Uh, maybe it'll even be the layer thing where you draw heavy or you paint heavy and then you turn down that layer's opacity afterwards. I think Tyson Murphy has all the set stuff set to like, he jumps from 30 to 80. Oh, geez, yeah. When he paints. Yeah, I was like, I can't micromanage that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's too much. But if it worked for him, though, like, that's awesome. Uh, Oh yeah, it obviously works for him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cat works for Blizzard. <laughs> uh, Jovi Adams says, "Hi guys, I used to be the left hand. I used to be left-handed, but due to several energies, I have switched hands a few times. I'm now right-handed, but it feels really unnatural. I practice, but it feels no progress. Thoughts?" And you know what? I have that thought like every other month of if I injured my hand or <laughs> for whatever reason my hand got severely injured, like cut off even, would I be able to train my left hand to work just as well as my right? So I think my best advice is, from what I would assume, it's gonna be very difficult. And to make that switch over, it's gonna be a painstaking, meticulous process because your mind is more suitable for creating good work than your physical ability at that time is. So you need the physical ability to catch up to your mental skill level, which is like a weird balance because usually, almost in every case, most artists, their physical ability matches their mental ability because they're working hand in hand, literally. And uh, then when you take the, the your hand away and you like imagine if I had to draw right now, if I had to do this orange with my left hand, I know the steps I need to take, but to actually do the work, it would be probably over my head. It would be too difficult for my left hand to register that. So I guess my best advice is no, like you're you're mentally you're there. And it's just gonna be that that long process of training your physical ability to catch up. Chicago Storm eighty eight, otherwise known as Rachel. Uh I think it's Rachel, or it might be Raquel. I'm not sure. It says, hi, I'm working on my first real job as a book illustrator. I feel like I am constantly doubting myself and dealing with nerves. How do you deal with your first real job? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I was actually going to make a tutorial about a week ago. I was like really inspired on making a tutorial on dealing with frustration. And I think that definitely goes hand in hand with doing digital art. If this is something that you love, it's a weird transition of doing what you love for work. 
It's like I love drawing, but then there are a lot of times I draw things that maybe I'm not passionate about, but I actually love drawing. So you, people sometimes associate, well, you get to do what you draw, or you get to do what you love every day. So like, you'll never have a bad day, but that's not true. Like, what you're going through with your first job, I think you're you're either going through frustration of, I don't know if I love this as much as I used to, and it like my it, as a hobby that used to be something I was so passionate about but now that it's my work it's and uh killed my fire a little bit or your doubt is coming from you don't think you're good enough which usually comes with artists that come out of either if you're just out of school college usually and your first job you are surrounded by artists that have been doing this for a long time so chances are they're going to be a lot better than you but that's like the best environment to be around. You always want to be in an environment where you're surrounded by people that are better than you because then it forces you to catch up and you'll learn from them. So I guess my advice is don't let that discourage you. If anything, let that encourage you and know that, yeah, I might not be as good as these people right now, but because they're around me and they'll give me advice, hopefully if they're good people, <laughs> then... Uh, I will get better because of them. So it's like a good, you're in a good position to be in right now. But if you don't grow and you feel like you're you're not growing, then it might be because you might be being stubborn about your work or you might not be adapting to whatever the work that they're giving you is. So, I mean, be open and willing to learn and accept that uh, these people are probably better than you and that you have to accept that. And that's okay. That's totally okay. And be very mindful of when they're giving critique. Don't get defensive. And just, like, be a sponge. Just absorb every bit of knowledge that you're given. All right, so really quick, I'm adding some subtleties of this lighter orange in the pulp. And... I want to break up that color because when it's so just solid orange, it's not as organic looking. It looks very flat. So to just give it a, a first breakup, I'm just adding more of that foundation layer. I'm adding to it without really being distracting. Okay. Andre says, I'm currently in an art block. I'm not sure if it's because I'm frustrated with my art skill or because I'm emotionally drained. As a young artist, how much should I focus on the career compared to being young and having fun? I want to find fun in art again. <laughs> okay, I kind of talked about in a sense of finding that balance, but it is emotionally draining. And... I don't know if you want to hear this, but you're going to have to sacrifice a lot of what you do if you really make art your number one priority. There were a lot of times in college where I didn't go to parties. I didn't experience things that I kind of regret in a, in a way just of like, I don't know if I lived 100% fully my college years because I always was in my room or in the main room of my apartment with my roommates and I would just always draw. Like they would always watching movies or have friends over and I would still have friends over every now and then but I would just always be drawing and that needs to be okay for you you need to be like okay my having fun is doing art and it pays off in the long run and it's that weird balancing system of you know still having fun and still having all the social life and you know friends and you know what life really is all about having that balanced with taking your career seriously and it, it isn't just a back burner thought it isn't just a side thought like it is always on your mind and you should be thinking about it constantly because this industry is a tough one it's not an easy industry so you really have to push yourself if you want to uh, make it in the long run I guess because I, I feel like I would be lying if I told you like just enjoy life have fun and like this this isn't a career where it that's not what it's focused on usually digital art becoming a good digital artist means spending hours upon hours in front of a computer drawing <laughs> and 
if if that really doesn't appeal to you, then I don't know if this is the career for you. And I don't want you in like, let's say four or five years from now being like, I, I got put in my wrong career. I picked the wrong career. I don't want that for you. So just know there's gonna be a lot of times of just you by yourself alone drawing and are you okay with that? I am that asks, how often do you do do you both compare yourselves to other artists, good or bad ones? I try never to compare myself to an artist that I feel is and the, oh man, I feel like I have this conversation with Joel a lot about being self aware and being honest with what skill level you're at and what skill level other people around you are at and then where you are at in terms of like compared to the the well-known artist, the well-established digital artist in today's day and age. And the best thing that you can do is compare yourself to the professionals. I would, in college, I would always look at my stuff and then what would be on like the cover of Imagine FX and be like, what is the gap that I'm trying to bridge here? And I want to build that bridge and that's what I would do. I would always strive to be better than what I was. And I feel like that's the best mentality to have because then you're not allowing yourself to settle for mediocrity. You're not settling at a place that you know deep down isn't outstanding. And when you compare yourself to artists that you consider weaker than yourself, it's like a weird, like I don't know why you would do that besides like boosting your ego, but then that almost makes it easier to like settle in the skill level that you're currently at. That's not right. That's not what you should be doing. Always compare yourself to uh, higher end people, but always, always compare yourself to yourself. So really look at what you're working on and are you improving as an artist? Do you feel like you're on autopilot sometimes? Do you feel like your growth has hit a plateau? Why is that? And challenge yourself. So. I, I think it's important to compare yourself to artists, but only do arts that you believe are better than you and focus on yourself. Yeah, that reminds me of a saying that one of uh, my clients told me once was like, you never want to a ask yourself the question, uh, is this it? You know, as far as like progression goes. But oh, yeah. the worst part is when you sit there and you finally realize this is it. Like you should never ask yourself, like, or you should never have that statement in your mind where like this is it, this is as good as it's going to get. Yeah, that's horrible. Because that means that you you don't see how you can improve, and it's at that point it's like you're you're just settled, and that's not good because that doesn't develop anywhere. <laughs> I think that's the worst thing an artist can do to themselves is just settle at whatever level they're at. Yeah. Uh, Chicago Storm 88 asks a uh, asks different question. Says, says, for artists that are going to conventions for pleasure, should they bring business cards and their portfolios for networking, or is that considered rude? <laughs> I don't consider that rude. There's been... I've been handed portfolios, I want to say a few times now at conventions. And uh, it's kind of like, it really isn't the appropriate time and place, but it's not like, I don't, I don't consider that rude. I would say, let's see, business cards, yes, you can bring them. Uh, it's kind of tough where like, when you see it as a networking opportunity, like what are you trying to get out of it? Are you trying to get them to critique your stuff? Are you trying to establish a working relationship with them? Like, cause usually at conventions, it's mainly for fun. Uh, I would say the best place is like somewhere like Spectrum. Like that's a convention where I definitely see it more as a networking over a fun opportunity. But I don't think that's rude. And I, I would just kind of gauge the artist on how you think they will interpret being handed a portfolio. And if you can just kind of tell like they're, they're a little too busy, they, they have too many customers in front of them, then don't bother them because then it comes across as like you're taking time and literally money away from that artist because you're uh, kind of pushing yourself on them and your work. 
But I, I, I enjoy seeing when people bring their portfolios and hand them to me and like, can you just give me a quick uh, review? Like, I, I love doing that. So yeah, I would say keep doing it. Yeah, I would say don't don't be rude about it. Just be like, and just like drop your portfolio on their table. <laughs> you know, just <laughs> don't do that. But at the same time, like I would, if anything, like you, like Tim, you like it when people, do you think you'd like it more if people like bought something little from you and then was like, hey, like, can you look at my portfolio because I'm an artist? Yeah, I think that would be like the considerate thing to do. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah, I think that, I think that's, a, I, especially if you admire this artist and you look up to them and you, and you're asking for their advice on your portfolio, you obviously think they're good. So why not spend like $5 on a little tiny thing that they have there or something, you know? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, not that it does, but it, it, in my mind, it kind of justifies the exchange then. Yeah. All right, so really quick, I'm going to now, with the foundation that I have, I'm going to go ahead and hide the outline that we created. So then this is what we're left with, and I can work with this. So if you hide your outline and you're, you can't really tell the forms or they're kind of getting lost, then I would keep working at your foundation, really look at the lines that you have provided and use them as guidelines and try to work up the different forms and values to the point where then you could hide the outlines if that's the path you desire to take. Where For me, I, I usually don't work with outlines after this point, so I'm going to hide them and I'm going to, especially for hyper-realism or just realism in general, there are no actual lines in life. There is no line art. There's no defining line edge. It's purely contrast from one form or one color to the next so or one value to the next and that's what creates the illusion of these outlines but uh, if you're trying to do realism I would push yourself to stay away from outlines in the later stages of uh, creating it uh, we have a response from Andrea she says Oh Tim, trust me, I'm not. I'm definitely not the party type. I very much prefer sitting at my desk with my tablet, but I'm still afraid I won't make it in the industry. I think they're more afraid of failure than anything else. Okay, and that's that's okay. I I'm telling you right now, doubt will kill more dreams than failure ever will. So if you keep trying and pushing yourself you will establish yourself and you'll become, you'll be fine. But you have to try. You have to put, just do work every day. Publish it. Do things that are outside of your comfort zone. If you're a character artist, try creatures or environments. And if, I guess this is something that I feel like is a bigger answer that I can give you where the industry is not an easy industry to get into. I have a lot of my friends that I, are still unemployed and I feel for them because it's tough. And some of them, I, I know how talented they are and they should have jobs. They just, it's sometimes comes down to maybe they're bad at doing interviews or something that doesn't even relate to the art side of things. And that's why I, I really want to instill in you a sense of confidence because if you feel doubtful about yourself or about your work, it'll come across when you do interviews or when you talk to people. So you want to be confident about your art, but you don't want to settle at whatever level you're at. So you want to be confident in, in the way of like, I'm open and willing to learn and also be, be true to that statement where then if someone's giving you a critique, let's say you're a higher end or your boss is giving you a critique, or even like your your co or if you're in school right now, like your colleague, uh, just take it and with an open mind, really listen to what they're saying, and then try to apply that advice if you uh, feel it was good a good critique. So <laughs> I I won't say it it it's an automatic guarantee that you'll get a job in the industry if you try hard, but you got to believe in yourself if you want to make it in this industry. I guess that's the best way I can put it for you. So don't give up hope. And uh, if, if you're the kind of person that prefers sitting at your desk with your tablet, then trust me, you'll be, 
you're on the right path because then you you'll you don't mind spending hours in front of a computer just drawing and trying to better yourself. Do you guys have any eyesight problems after staring at a computer screen for 24/7? <laughs> uh yeah, there's one vein in my eye which I don't want to show you guys, but it's like permanently broken. And it's like right around I used to wear contacts before I got LASIK and there's a vein that like it it's always going to be there and it sucks, but <laughs> yeah, I know some people actually wear those uh yellow glasses when they're behind their computer. Yeah. And I don't know if I could ever do that realistically. So I would say, yeah, it kind of comes with the profession of, yeah, you're staring at, because when you think about it, your computer screen is just a bright light. So you're literally staring at a bright light every day for hours at a time. I'm going to say I wear glasses too. Amplified. I think, I think the biggest thing is taking breaks and not only like for your wrists, but for your eyes, like get up, blink a couple times, walk around, do other things for like five minutes. You know, that's all you need. Take a five minute break and then go back at it. Mm -hmm. I think that'll, I think that'll go a long way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh man, I'm going to, okay. <laughs> I got to start outlining the pulp. So this might take, so this is the perfect time for doing questions, if you guys have any, because what I'm doing right now, let me do a, so in this little example square, right now I'm looking at the reference and I'm trying to apply a different outline that the pulp gives me and it's going to be subtle, but it's going to be light and uh, if you know what the pulp looks like, usually it's like this and like a little string at the end. And like, imagine this collected in a clump together, like smushed against each other and sometimes seemingly random forms uh, or like lines will appear. But uh, with organics, you got to work with that and you got to use that to your advantage. So I'm going to literally be doing this subtle lighting effect on the entire inside of the pulp. And this is usually what will uh, like deter people from doing it where art isn't always this like fun like oh i get to draw like yeah it's sometimes it's legit i call it the like the sucky part it's like right now i gotta just push through the sucky part of this orange and I'll, I'll know i'll have a lot of fun laying in the highlights but if i don't build that solid foundation first then i won't have fun doing the the fun part so you gotta build yourself up for the fun part uh, Jake Scott says, also, I've missed the past couple of live streams due to sickness in school, but did Joe move in? Yes, Joe is officially my new roommate, and uh, in a couple of months, we're actually getting Corinna, and uh, that's Joe's girlfriend, and she is the one that taught me how to use uh, sculpting and casting and molding, and it literally will be an art house. I feel like it's just one of those incubators where... We're just going to like try to become the best artists that we can. And I, I forgot, or no, it was my friend Schmitty who always tells me, you want to surround yourself with friends that are very passionate about what you do because it rubs off on you significantly. Like there's been studies of whoever you surround yourself with greatly affects your motivations, your like at, literally a lot of who you are. And it definitely affects your work habits and uh, like I had another friend that was here for a week and he was working on his comic in the kitchen every day. And I almost was, it was like borderline jealous because I was like, man, he's really like pushing his own story. And like, he inspired me to now start like every night I'm working on my, my book. And I think it took him just seeing him, just being around someone else that is passionate about uh, work to finally push me to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do that too. Like, thanks, Tyler. And I, I think if you're in school, surround yourself with the artists that you can just tell are very passionate about drawing. And those are the people you want to stick with.
D Brown says those yellow glasses, the gunner glasses, are really bad for people that do creative arts. I use I use those once, and what seemed like red to me through the glasses is really pink. The yellow will mess with your colors. Yeah, I think that's why I always was like, I don't know if I want to do that. But thank well, you for clarifying. Is, this is a really good question. All right, really um, good question. From Lily, it says, Tim, do you think it's important to upload work onto sites like DeviantArt and Concept.org when you're still quite an amateur-ish level? I'm a bit shy when putting my art out there, and I'm not really at a level where I'd get much recognition. Oh, you totally set me up. I thought it was going to be like a funny question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, this is a legit good question. You're right. Uh, yes, I, I think it's so important for you to post. And the, here's ready for the tough part not expecting feedback or anyone to like it. That can be probably one of the toughest things starting out as an artist is because you work so hard and you want some justification or like, I don't know, some kind of a recognition of the effort that you put forward. And it kind of sucks when you put something out and literally you get like two views and zero likes. I've been there. If you check out my DeviantArt, like all my old stuff from high school, like, yeah, it's not. And admittedly, it's not even that great. But posting it then allowed me to move forward. And I'm not like sitting in my past work because it's already online. I'm, I'm already done with it. I can move forward. So sometimes I think it's just a mental thing where when you post it, you can be done with it then. Then it like forces you to move on because you, you finished that piece. Like there's no need to continue working on it because you already posted it. So yes, I think it is important for you to post even as a younger artist and that fan base will eventually grow. It's like uh, you, you're you looking for like a lot of feedback and success without that journey first. You want to get to the destination without going through the journey. And that's like skipping a lot of the fun. And I, I definitely do not recommend like hoarding all your art to yourself and then selectively posting like every couple months. Because then, and I mean, without sounding critical, people will just forget you. And like, if you post like once every four months, like, oh yeah, that artist, and okay, that's kind of cool. But then if they don't hear from you in four months, then again, then you're not really like an artist that would be someone that I would get excited about seeing their new work. Like, there are some artists that I'm sure you guys follow too, like Sakimi, or not even Sakimi as much anymore, but like Zeronis, or. Um, like my personal favorites, like Feverworm, every time she posts something, like I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. And it's usually like literally every day. And I, I don't mean for that to intimidate you guys, but like big name artists usually post at least twice or three times a week. And I think that's a good goal to hit in the long run. But for now, maybe just try at least hitting one a week. Just try hitting one, something that you drew and uh, you're, you're proud of and you want to post. And sometimes post things that you aren't as proud of. Maybe you invested like 20 hours and you're like, ah, you know, this didn't turn out exactly how I wanted to and I, I kind of want to move on to another piece. Then just post it and be done with it because then essentially you're burying it because then you don't feel the need to come back to it because you've already like put your hands clean of it. You're like, nope, I'm done. And then let's say in a year from now, you want to go back to that piece and like a, do what you originally wanted to do on it, then people could see, oh, wow, like they posted it a year ago. Look how much they've grown in a year. And trust me, people look at that. Like sometimes artists wonder like, will people even really like notice that I did it a year ago? Yes, there are artists out there, myself included, that will look at like, what did they do in 2013? Do I feel like they've grown in it as an artist since then? And it's always so cool seeing the ones that really like grow and you can just see it in the years of work that they post. So sorry for her, the long answer on that one, but yes. Short answer, yes. There's no funny questions. Come on, guys. <laughs> that, was funny one. that one funny it's a serious live stream today. Uh, not really. A lot, of, a lot of serious questions. Well, I guess if any of you guys watch Face Off, uh, I'm kind of curious if you guys agreed with who won it. And I'm sure that there's maybe one or two of you that actually know what I'm talking about, but I'm curious either way. You know my stance on that one. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't as happy with the winner, but 
I, I think they were all good. I think, though, yeah, I don't know. I all I want to hear from if you guys know <laughs> first, and then I'll talk about it. Uh, Mike asks, what artists do you look up to? Hmm. Right now, uh, it's. I feel like it changes every like few months on like who are like my top three that I, I really feel inspired by. Uh, the ones that seem pretty consistent throughout the years is uh, Feverworm, and actually maybe I'll do a quick little. So Feverworm has always been one of those that I just love her use of color. Uh, Rodner the Fifth, I've always had crush on her work it's just it's so good it's exactly what i would want my work to look like and just her confidence in the way that she shades is amazing um and then i i'm really inspired by artists that are maybe even long gone uh james gurney or yeah james gurney and Ner norman Rock rockwell i feel like norman rockwell is another one of those that i'm just always like heavily inspired like i always keep his book by my desk or something and then ones that you guys might know, uh, Loesch has been, I feel like she's been kicking ass like the past three months, like with every new piece where I'm just like, man, yeah, you are, you're rocking it. Like I can tell you're excited about what you're working on and the, it, it's showing in the results. Uh, Zeronis used to be another one of my big ones. Uh, I'm kind of waiting for him to do some more original stuff and be blown away like I used to. Uh, Peter Moorbacher with his Angelarium and all of those that have been coming out recently, I think those are like awe-inspiring because they're just they're very gorgeous and beautiful. And then when I think of like traditional, Alan Williams. He's like my hero when it comes to traditional drawing. And he was the one that kind of pushed me into getting back into it, where I always would sketch in my spare time, but then seeing his work and being like, this is all you do. Like you only do traditional stuff and you're like a successful, well-established artist. Like I want to do that. Like I, I love drawing traditionally sometimes over drawing digitally. And I think that's where your influences become such a big part of you as an artist because then it does, it kind of pushes you in different directions. Like you might be going down a, diff a pretty definitive path, but then they might just alter you or like angle you just a little bit and those little subtle pushes uh, can really affect your art in the long run. Do either of you have tattoos? <laughs> oh my God, we were just talking about this last night. Yeah. Um, I'll probably never get a tattoo, but I, I, the tattoos that I, I do enjoy are the ones that are like uh, sh they're shapular or they confine to the forms of the body. So they like they enhance the overall appearance of the body as a whole rather than it being just like a selective image type deal. Would you ever would you ever tattoo a piece of your art on your body? No. Because and at the end of the day, isn't it kind of like branding? Yeah. Which I mean, I I would feel even probably more weird about posting my own art on myself, but I'm like, I really like my work. <laughs> All right, I need to Google something. I need to see if anyone's ever tattooed the McDonald's logo on their body. Oh yeah, people companies used to pay. I remember in like the mid two thousands, companies would pay people to brand themselves with their logo. And they would be like, if you tattoo our logo or symbol on your body, we'll give you like 200 bucks. Why would you get... People did it because they needed money. No, these people tattooed their receipt on their, on their forearm. Their receipt? Their McDonald's receipt. Oh, I have no idea. There's some crazy people out there, Joe. Oh my goodness. I don't get it. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, James Gurney is still going, yo. 
No, I know. <laughs> no, I'm not saying like he's dead or he's past his prime. Just like an artist that I would consider more of like a master rather than like one of the modern artists that are like the current generation, I should say. Yeah, you really don't hear from him. James Gurney? Yeah. I don't see anything posted by him in a while. I know like uh, last year because Pui did that contest for him. He does more like community oh, stuff now, I think. That's right. And didn't he win the the award, the Masters Award at Spectrum like two years, or not last year, but the year before? Did he? I Maybe, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure he did. You guys don't know what Spectrum is? I feel like I, I am like advertising it every live stream. I would go check it out. It's like literally the Academy Awards of Digital Art, and it, it was like the greatest. I would almost consider it, if not the number one greatest moment, of my life of just like being around people that I felt understood me, my life and the amount of work and time and effort that you put into this. And like, they just, they, they understood. And not only that, I felt like I was looking into what my future could be if I continue down this path. And I, I really, uh, I really want to be one of those people. And I want to have that established uh, set of friends and uh, just I don't know. I I think it's one of those goals that every digital artist that takes this very seriously should go to Spectrum and like just be surrounded by that. Pre it's like the most inspiring thing I've ever been around in my life. I remember when we left Spectrum last year, all of us in the car were just like, we wanted to draw. We wanted, we, we had so many draw. ideas. <laughs> we, like in the car, I was like, I drew the entire like eight hour ride home. It was just, oh God, it was so inspiring. Yeah, I remember drawing clouds and stuff. <laughs> remember when we did the trade-off where you would give me a topic to draw, I would give you a topic to draw? Oh, God, that was horrible. <laughs> My, uh, what was it? I drew, I drew a, advent, like a traveling salesman. That's with right. A, with a really big mustache. I don't remember what I drew. Didn't you make me draw a voluptuous woman? Yeah, I think so. I know you made me draw... Or... Uh, I think it was like a female woman of the night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which I don't know any other type of... <laughs> I don't know why I said female woman of the night. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, there's male... Oh, yeah, because you said female. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, sh I just got rid of... It. Hold on. Uh, it says... It was a funny question. Should I start robbing banks in order to afford art school lessons? You're going to need to rob more than a bank. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're setting your set sights too low. Go big. Rob like a credit card company. Take over the world. Yeah. Just, How you thinking? just make a giant volcano layer or a death star. For some reason, I kept thinking of what Dr. Evil always built. Right? That's I don't know like, why that becomes my definition of evil lair. Or uh, Mr. Freeze. <laughs> oh, the penguins hide away. That's, that was just... A sewer, I guess. But Yeah, it, no. was like, it, was, it was the middle of a sewer, and then they had a table <laughs> in the middle of a platform. That was his lair. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, really quick. So if you see in the orange how it has these like little porous circles on the edge, so I'm I'm gonna hint on the form now, but I'm not gonna do that because I consider that more of like a final polished detail pass. So right now I'm just kind of edging out this lighter orange to surround those circle shapes, but I'm not gonna detail them yet because like I said it earlier, I'm gonna save the finer detailing for near the end, and that includes the highlights. Alma Freeman says, how would you suggest I go about using line art as guidelines rather than depending on them? I feel like when I make digital paintings, once I remove the line art, it simply does not turn out how I pictured it. I, that'll happen. Um, I remember a lot of times when I, I still wasn't really confident with color, I would get so frustrated because in my head it looked amazing, but 
when I tried to lay it out, it just looked amateurish. And I think the best transition was just giving it time and just accepting the fact that what I'm drawing while I was in school, it won't be amazing, but I'm going to push for it to be as good as I can possibly make it. And then with the next piece, I'm going to strive to push it a little bit further. And uh, usually there will be a point where when you remove the lines on one of your pieces, you'll be like, oh, like, yeah, that's a that's kind of what I was thinking. Or if you really feel like it's it's lost when you do your digital paintings and you remove the line art, then it's probably not tight enough. Like it doesn't read well enough yet. So sometimes it might be adjusting your values, really looking at, at the edges and maybe they're too blurry or muddy and trying to tighten that up a bit. Draw an eye with your left hand. <laughs> I will, just not during the stream. Next week I will. Maybe next week will be more of a fun one. Uh, oh, this is a good question uh, from Ellie Watkins. It says, when trying to reach out to other artists for critiques or tips, would you have any suggestions on how to do this without coming off as being obnoxious, needy, or a freeloader? Hmm. <laughs> this is an interesting question. All right, so usually I receive like two to four messages a week and usually like 25% of the time, they'll send a piece of their work for me to critique. All right, the best thing that I would recommend for this is one, understand that usually if you're sending it to someone that might be incredibly busy, they probably won't get back to you right away. So the first thing, don't get offended if it takes a while for them to get back to you. Two is when they do respond to you and they critique your stuff, don't push it like then don't send a new piece that you've been working on because they already went out of their way for you and they're you know giving you a critique and then to be like bombarded then with a new one it's almost like a lack of respect for the person's time at that point so uh be very conscious of that as well and then without being obnoxious needy or a freeloader um, I guess maybe give an example of why you admire this artist. Usually uh, flattering the person is the best way to kind of convince them to be like, okay, like this is a legit fan. Like I, I do feel the need to give feedback because they've been following me and um, it's, it's almost a, a courteous thing at that point then. And then I guess coming off as obnoxious. The only way I think someone will come off as as a knock obnoxious as if it was like constantly messaging the person or not appreciating the feedback that they were given. And I, the other thing is if they never get back to you, like there are some artists that I reached out to that just never got back to me. Just don't be offended by it. Maybe they didn't have time to respond or they were just doing other things and maybe forgot about it. Like, that's okay. Like don't take it personally there'll be another artist that you reach out to that will get back to you. Apparently there's a problem with me trying to hit done on the question. There we go, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, D Brown says, are you guys going to be running a booth at Spectrum next month or will you be there as a guest? Uh, well, I, ho I hope you'll be there, D Brown, and maybe we'll be able to meet each other finally. But uh, I will be, Joe is going with me, or we're going as a group. It's going to be me, Joe, Corinna, uh, uh, Tyler Johnson, who is another uh, artist friend that we have, and then Pui Che. And the five of us will be there. And Pui and I will have a booth. So it's one of those things where, yeah, we have a booth, but I'm literally going there because that is one of the best times of my life. 
I don't care if I don't sell anything at that convention. I Google just crashed. I'll be right back. All right. <laughs> All right. Joe is down and out for the account, but he will be back. Well, no, am I here? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, then I'm here. <laughs> oh, the Q&A thing just busted. Can you not see it anymore? No, I'm going to try to reload it. Hold on. All right. I see in the comments, Dennis, and you will be there. Good, because then I will get to meet you finally. Okay, it's good. Perfect. Oh. Uh, Diana Chris says, hi, kind of random question, not pertaining to sliced fruit, but how do you, did you react to people telling you to draw things for them for free and getting upset, confused when you don't or can't? I'm not in the industry yet, but it's still kind of unfair. Uh, just brush it off. I don't even let it phase me. It, it happens, well, at first, ad admittedly, it was like, um, I, I think I was too much of a yes man and I would just I would do jobs that I really shouldn't have for the potential uh, advertising that I was getting that's usually my payment was uh, just like some BS on getting yourself out there or whatever I think it's good to do internships I don't think it's good to sell yourself short and do work for free because then literally that the person that's asking you to do it is taking advantage of you, not only as an artist, but as a person. And that's kind of gross. So if you can recognize that a person is doing that and they get offended when you don't do it for them, it's one of those things, just blow it off. Don't even give it a second thought. There's going to be people out there that are like that, but you can't let that bother you. I'm gonna say, you shouldn't get upset over something like that. That's not your problem. Mm -hmm. If they keep harassing you, just tell them to talk to me. <laughs> I'll take care of it for you. Uh, how important is it for an artist to maintain an active relationship with one's fans, such as replying to comments? Important. Uh, it's important, but at the same time, it sometimes like hold on I bet I can be the perfect example right now of not getting back to people and admittedly I have that reputation just because sometimes things happen and you're you don't see like right now I have three messages in my inbox on my art page and will I get to them tonight probably not will I get to them tomorrow maybe uh, I think it's one of those things where as long as you do take the time, at least like try once a week, that's usually my goal of like once a week, I, I really should check my messages and respond to people. And I don't, I've never really gotten like a message of like, oh, you, you took so long to respond. Like what the hell, dude? Like, I, I never really got that. So I think they, they, they understand. And I think the worst thing that you could do is just completely ignore them and never respond to them. Unless if they're being like harassing you for some reason for like, wanting a critique and you never give them it after you've already talked to them and sometimes those people you just have to like ignore because then they're not a fan they're literally trying to leech off you in some way and that that's when it becomes like no like come on dude you're you're pushing it here <laughs> jake scott joe you have a girlfriend lol <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that's a laughing matter question mark uh, yeah I don't know uh, yeah <laughs> alright so now I'm going to get into some of the highlight placements here just because let's see we have like 15 minutes oh no we have like 25 okay never mind I think I'm going to do some of these little circles on the rim here
Oh. Arnold Wee says, can you give any suggestions for finishing work? I find it to be difficult to maintain the initial momentum of starting. Uh, yeah, you kind of caught me at a good time where I'm finally like pushing out work that should have been done long, long, long ago. Uh, so for finishing work, man, that last 80 to 90%, if this is the hump that you're talking about right now where it's like, you're so close to being done, but you just can't accept the way it looks on publishing it the way it is. That's a tough hill to get over. Trust me, it's tough. And my best advice for you is to not kill yourself over it. I think I, I allowed myself too much time in between, but if it's really frustrating you to the point of like, you're just trying to get it finished, like you don't even care about how aesthetically pleasing it is anymore, then you need to walk away from that piece and do a different piece for the time being. Because then you're aiming for it to look complete rather than it, for it to look good. And I think that there's a, a difference between that. Now, the worst thing that you could do is kind of what I sometimes dabble in is where you put it on the back burner for way too long. And especially if that piece is almost done, you, should, you shouldn't put it off more than like a week or two. And then go back to it and then really look at it and analyze, okay, why does this not look finished to me? And then fix it. Like, Take your critical eye and really look at it and be like, why didn't I like this before? And uh, let's say it was the shading or something, be like, okay, I can kind of see now how the shading doesn't look right in this area and maybe that's why it was bothering me. And then, then it will probably be easier to finish it for you. So I guess to find that momentum to finish it, uh, sometimes, sometimes it'll just happen where the piece will start from start to finish and everything works out perfect. But that's not going to be every case. And I think it, the best thing you can do is just accept that not all of your pieces will be like a walk in the park from start to finish. Some of them will be like a mountain climb. And you just have to accept that uh, it will be frustrating because it's like, well, the last time I went for a run, it was like super easy. But this time it's like hilly and I can barely get over some of the humps without getting tired. And that'll happen. So just know that happens and you can push through. That's my advice. K.O. Ken Krillin asks, would you make art with poo with no gloves for a million dollars? I thought they were just misspelling pooey, like make art with pooey. Um, um, would I make art with my feces? No. I... I have come to learn as I get older that there's a difference between, well, without getting too much into it, money isn't as important as the movies and television make it out to be. If you can sustain your lifestyle comfortably and you're happy, then I, I would say there's no reason for me to embarrass myself for money. Unless if I, well, no, actually no, I, I wouldn't consider any reason. Faith Newman says, I'm working on improving my artistic skills such as facial structure and anatomy. How do I know when I have improved enough that I can move on to learning something new? I hope that makes sense. I have improved enough that I can make. Um, you know, that's a tough question because I, I never feel like you can master. Well, all right. This is my, hopefully I can answer this in a good way. We're like, I feel pretty confident in drawing faces, but there's always something I could improve on. Like whether it's the structuring of a cheekbone or understanding the jawline a bit better. Like even though I feel pretty confident where I'm at right now, that doesn't mean that I'm just gonna be like, I'll never, or like I need to focus elsewhere. Well, see that's a tough question because as long as you're learning and you're pushing yourself to learn, I don't think there's a bad way to go about doing it. I just think you should never feel like 100% confident in what, or like settle at the level that you're at when you're creating something that you even feel pretty confident about doing. Never be like, okay, now I'm, I'm good enough in this area. I'll never have to like, I'm good. I'm done. I think it's good to maybe look at areas that are you are weak at, improve on those, but always keep the other thing on the back burner and really keep in mind that uh, you want to improve those skills as well.
Man, that's a tough one. No, I'm trying to reread it again. How do I know when I have improved oh. enough that I can move on to learn something new? I, the other part of me just says, like, you'll know. Like, you'll know in the, the back of your mind and in your, your head, you're like, okay, I think I'm at the point where I need to move on to something else. Well, yeah, I mean, like, I think it goes with if I were to say, hey, draw me the anatomical structure of the hand and then draw me like draw me a full rendered hand and you can keep and you can do that more than just once i think that's i think you're pretty solid but i think that if you can especially do it without reference then i think you've you've got the the full handle on it you know yeah but just never settle where it's like you can always do it better but you know what there is a place where you're like i can pass with this looking at this quality and it'll still read very well. Yeah, that's that's tough. Uh oh. I'm Matt says I like experimenting with other people's styles. It usually ends up being a mix of their style and mine, but my gallery ends up being all over the place. What could <laughs> the benefits and disadvantages to this be? Um, I guess looking unsure of your work and what direction you want to take. I think it's good to try out other artists' styles for yourself and see what you can pick up from it that you enjoy. But I think if you do it too much, then you're you're lost in finding your own style. Then you become like a artist jumper and you're just jumping from one to the next. I I, I do think having some sense of direction in your work is good and I think when you look at your gallery as a whole if it doesn't read as a solid direction then I would change that and I would look at your gallery and be like okay now what why does this look so disorganized and crazy and it's probably because you don't have enough original work or work that you're really passionate about that's your own that kind of stands out yeah but there's also the idea of like people's styles are their style along with other meshed ones together. And over time, I think it changes, you know? That's true. Like, if you're a newer artist, it might be all over the place. And that that's usually the case, I would say. Yeah, I, I would say there's nothing wrong with that at yeah, all. Yeah, because you're still kind of finding yourself as an artist. Especially, like, if it's a deviant art gallery. Yeah. And it's like... Yeah, if there's a piece from three years ago where it's just in black and white and say you really like doing color now, but it looks like, uh, you know, it, say it looks like Norman Rockwell stuff, you know, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Yeah, it just meant you changed as an artist, you grew. But yeah. if you feel like you're drawing, like there's a bunch of anime that looks like the specific artist style and then you're drawing a bunch of like, Nickelodeon cartoons or something if it, if it really looks like you're just like un you're completely unsure and you're experimenting without a sense of direction I think that's a problem I think it's good to experiment but when you're really like there's no end goal there's no passion behind it then I think that's where the, the problem lies Uh, it says, when I see improvements in my art, it always seems like I, it jumps every few months rather than a gradual increase. Why is that? Oh, it's good. I feel the same way. Uh, that's normal. I feel like uh, going back to that bar graph chart that I always reference is when you hit your plateau, that's when you'll do the same amount of work for a specific amount of time until you're like, you know, I... I'm I can I can get better. There's some stuff that I want to experiment with. I'm going to try some new stuff and I'm going to push myself to get better. And then you'll go on that incline where you're working, you're experimenting, you're doing new pieces, and then once you are like, yeah, this is where I'm at. I'm going to pump out some pieces at this current skill level. That's where you plateau again. So your plateaus probably just happen to be uh, a few months. And that's okay. That's totally normal. D. Brown says, I'm still having trouble with porous materials. Leather is the main, but even this outer orange rind is giving me similar issues. I'm trying to speckle. I'm trying to speckle like, but I seem to create an edge. 
uh, for the outer orange? I think, yeah, I think you know those little pores. Oh, these like little circles? Yeah. Okay, right, so I just took a circle hard edge brush. I laid it down like that. And then I grabbed a darker edge and then I worked up. I think I used my skin brush. I went back to the skin brush because I wanted some texture on it. Then I literally like just outlined and gave an indentation look to it so that it looks indented inward. Yeah, can That's you zoom out like a ton so that way people can see what it looks like on a small scale? Uh, do what? Can you zoom out so that way like people can see how it. It transfers. I don't think it'll let me zoom out. Or wait, hold on. I can make my thing really small. And then, yeah. See, so even because on a small scale, it, it just looks like it's a pour now because the shadow is is hitting. It was just like pushed in. Yeah. I think don't rely on like a speckle brush to do this part for you. Like, take the time and actually detail it. Where you, I mean, you just saw me do all the circles on the edge. Yeah, it'll take like five, ten minutes. It shouldn't take any more than that, but uh, I don't think I just would want to get away with like, where's my my speckle brush? Is this it? Like if I grabbed this kind of a speckle brush and then like went around the outside and then erased all the excess, like that's trying to do a shortcut for a time that isn't appropriate for doing a shortcut. And now I'm going to do one overlay pass just so I can amplify some of the juiciness here. And then we get to do the highlights. Jake Scott says, orange glad I didn't say banana. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Whole stream, I was like, there's got to be an orange joke that is going to come our way sometime. All right, I got a question lined up if, you, if you're going to talk about the orange and what you're doing. Or right, you can go. Okay, it says, how does one go about giving and receiving good critiques? Most of the critiques I receive boils down to, yeah, it looks pretty good, but I've recently come to realize that that's about the most I have to offer when giving critique out as well. Oh, then that's a problem. Uh, whew. How does one about giving and receiving, did they ask? Yeah. All right, when you're receiving critique, just take it. Don't get defensive. That it looks so petty when an artist gets defensive over their work. And even if you feel like you're explaining it because they don't maybe see what you're seeing, doesn't matter. It still comes across as very petty. And I would just absorb what they're saying and then later evaluate what they said. Really, really look at it with a critical eye and be like, now, do I feel they were accurate in their critique or if I if I really disagree with it and it's for unbiased reasons, then that, that's completely cool. Then just don't do their critique. I think the worst thing you can do is give them the satisfaction of like getting riled up and then looking like a petty artist that, you know, is defensive over the work. Uh, so my advice, just take their, take their critique like a sponge. Don't give a, you know, voluntary response of like, oh, no, no, this is why it looks like this. And just like, okay, okay. And then when you're giving critique, don't just give a critique because you feel it's necessary. And maybe it's like what you heard from a teacher, say, or somewhere on the internet or a YouTube video where they said it and you're, you're trying to like pump yourself up and look like an established artist because you know the terminology or whatever. Like that, that doesn't help anyone. I think you'll, you need to look at someone else's work and give it an honest and a fair assessment in your mind to the best of your knowledge of what you think could be improved upon and then let them know. That's the best way you can give a critique. And you know, some people say sandwich it with a compliment and then critique and then compliment. Do whatever path you need to take to feel comfortable with. But the best thing you can do is be honest and uh, don't uh, see, it, it depends on with each artist because there are some artists out there that I, I am a little more reserved about because I know they might be more sensitive and I don't want to hurt their feelings because that could actually discourage them from improving their art. So if you can get a good gauge on them as an artist and if you think they can take it, then I don't feel like there's a need to sugarcoat it. And you can be, you can just tell them. 
you tell them, okay, th this area looks rough. I think you could clean it up here, blah, blah, blah. And when you're able to be that honest with someone, that person will grow so much faster than if you feel you have to like walk on eggshells or walk on glass or w when giving a critique. So the other part of taking a, cr a critique is don't be sensitive. Even if you are sensitive, hide it. Do your best to hide it because uh, the people that give you critique that want you to get better sometimes will come across as cold even because they're very to the point of what they think needs to look better and they don't care about hurting your feelings because they want you to be a better artist. And that's that kind of fine line of they're not degrading or like trying to put themselves above me. They're trying to raise me up, you know, that kind of a mentality of, okay, they're critiquing me because they care kind of a thing. And hopefully that's the truth behind how they're critiquing you. And that's, those are the kind of people you want to find to give critiques. Like there are a few people that I really trust on giving me uh, a critique without bias, without uh, sugarcoating it whatsoever. Nubia was one of those artists in college that never complimented me once during school. And if she did, it might've been like in passing or as a joke. And <laughs> like, I, I now looking back, I appreciated that she was so hard on me because uh, it always pushed me to work, uh, I guess, harder. And she never felt the need of like, she never thought she was hurting my feelings because she wasn't. She was pushing me to be a better artist. And that's how I felt. I, I became a better artist in a shorter amount of time because of those people that give critiques and they're honest. And I just, I just took it. Just take the damage of whatever they're saying and apply it to your work. And you'll you'll see the results. You'll see it get better. And you're like, oh, wow, like they were right. And I think once you have that first moment of, oh, wow, they were right, then you're so much more open to receiving critique in the future because you know the results that it can get. So yeah, I think those would be my tips on receiving and giving critique. Yeah, I was going to say, but also know like what's stepping over the line, you know? Because I got in trouble in that in college <laughs> of critiquing someone and then apparently it was just too much because um, <laughs> I didn't know something about them. But the other thing is what I would recommend doing if you're going to receive a critique is take out a notepad and listen to what the person's saying and write it down because what you're doing at that point is you're acknowledging what they're saying and you're writing it down and it's not in the heat of the moment. I think a lot of times people are driven at that distinct point right then when people are like, well, this is, this needs to be like this. And then your people's immediate reactions is to fight it. And I think what would be smarter is if you just had the notebook and you wrote down what they said. And then later on you can read it by yourself and you can assess what they mean by what you wrote down. Because when it's coming from someone else's mouth, it sometimes comes off as, uh, like uh, aggressive, but if you write it down, it's it it's not as aggressive because you wrote it down. That's a really good idea. Because yeah, sometimes critiques come off as like grossly entitled, like oh, you think you're a better artist than me, kind of a thing. But you're right. If you just write it down, you just there's no need to fight it, and you can look at it and assess it later on. Uh. Oriole says, your fruit puns are unparable. Oh, God. I, could, I couldn't think of one on the spot. I usually am pretty good at that. Well, you, it's, it's hard not to do berry ones because you already did berries. Yeah, we already did berries. Um, we're running at like four minutes. All right. I think this might go a little over. I just want to do the highlights all around the orange. Okay. And we'll... Cut off the stream, and then I, I'm going to go to Menards and get some planting tools. <laughs> uh, Serenity Moonshadow says, do you think sometimes that you did a, that you took a step backwards rather than advancing in, with improving with your art? Good question. I want to say yes. Uh, I, I do say there are times where I'll look at my current piece of work and I'll look at the piece I just did 
and feel it doesn't add up. So there are times where I even remember talking to my friend Gabe on, sometimes you look at your old work and you're like, man, how did I do that? And that, that's a good feeling to have, but uh, not letting that like kill you of like, I'll never do anything as good as that again. Uh, I never would say I regressed enough to the point where it was like noticeable, but you'll have like those little up and down moments of recognizing like today is not your day. You were definitely better, you know, last week and uh, you'll, you'll have to get back on that level. Oh man. Dave T says, I guess you'll be done with this orange once it will, once it, <laughs> once it will ran out of juice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a ripe one. There you go. There we go. There we go. That's the Tim I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Benjamin says, hi, first live stream. I was wondering how you choose your color palettes. Sure. So usually... I, I really like to use reference and um, like even on the color palette up here, I just color picked from the orange itself and I put it on the side and if there are some colors I really liked working with, then I'll add them to my swatch off window and I'll pull from them because I, I worked with those colors and I know how to use them and how, what they work well against. So sometimes it, it actually most of the times it just comes down to experimenting with different colors and then realizing what colors work best in certain scenarios. And then uh, like uh, Purple Cacleon is probably the best person I talked with that explained color. And you can't just give someone a color palette and they'll be better at using color. There has to be an understanding and knowing how to use those colors for though for that knowledge to really seep in and uh, kind of stick resonate with the artist. So when picking your color palettes, chew, look at like pieces that you might admire, you look at and you're like, man, those are awesome color palettes. Really analyze it, maybe bring it into Photoshop, color pick from it and add it to your palette and be like, now what about these colors do I like? Did they in evoke kind of a feeling in me that uh, was like happiness or maybe a warmth and you really like how it kind of gave a feeling of a temperature? and you're trying to recreate that in your own work, uh, it just comes down to properly using the colors, and uh, that just comes with time and experimenting. Uh, it says, Ely Watkins says, I hear a lot of mixed opinions on using photo textures in digital work. What are your thoughts? I think it's, you're right. This is actually one of those things where it goes back and forth on being a gray area where some people rely on them so heavily that I think that's when I don't like them. But I think if you use them as like a after effect or to give, um, like when sometimes when I do, I remember two years ago I was first experimenting with using photos and implementing them into my work. And the best way that I, I found using photos is if, like let's say I drew leather pants and then I did all the values for it, I did an initial color pass and I did some of my own texturing to it. And at the very end, if I bring in a texture that I took and then I overlaid it and then set the layer opacity lower, and it, it really does add a really nice effect, I'll give it that. But I think too many artists rely on that, and that's where the problem comes up. So I would say use it minimally and use it effectively without it becoming a distraction. Because when it becomes a distraction, that's when I think it becomes a problem. And that's when usually people have a problem with it when they see it in other artists' work, where it's like, well, then, then they almost can sideline all the work that you just did, and they can be like, well, they use the texture. And you don't want that to be the way that you're perceived as just like they're good because they know how to use textures. Sydney Kruger asks, will you guys paint a mural in your house? Yes. We are. 
Uh, in the basement, I I already talked to I or I thought I talked to you about. Oh no, I talked to Karina about this. Um, so if you guys don't know, I usually have all the artists that I have come over to my house when a convention's coming up, and we'll just work and hang out. And I have a a basement like dedicated to conventions, and uh, I wanted a, a wall where each of the artists would draw and paint something on the wall and then at the very end it would be like this collection of the con artist's work that each that like we all contributed to because I, I do feel very much like on a team with the con artist group so yeah that's what i was planning now, let me zoom out my orange I kind of like how we, so you can see before and after the highlight, how it's not, I'm not, I'm not adding that much to it. It's like very minimal, but that minimal amount really then adds a certain amount of realism that it didn't have before. Now, what I'll probably do, and I, I won't do it during the stream, but just so you guys know, so when I post the exercise next week, the difference between the orange you see now and the orange that you'll see then is I'm going to add a lot more nuances of color transitions because you can see, let me pull up the, oops. Okay, so like right here, look at all these different shapes and nuances that are going on that I was not able to capture as well yet. So in the final push, I'll really go in on each pulp triangle and I will give them an extra layer of detail that's not present right now. Or even like, it looks like there were three seeds that were cut in half in the core of this orange. That's a little detail that I want to try to recapture because that, once again, that adds a level of realism that I don't have currently. So I think we'll cut off the stream. Well, I guess that's not fair because I usually give a, let's do three more questions and then we'll cut off the stream. Okay. Uh, if you could go anywhere in the art world, or if you go anywhere in the world to study art, where would it be and why? It's from Andrew. To study for my art? Oh, God. <laughs> I I don't know if that's a fair question, just because there's a lot of different places I want to go to for different reasons. I would say if I had to give, like, a larger encompassing area somewhere in Europe most likely France uh, just the look and architecture and even sometimes the feeling or at least from what I am given through what I know of, of what's over there I really 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 enjoy it and I enjoy the look I enjoy the atmosphere and I would love to go over there with just like a camera and just like <laughs> go crazy and uh, I would say that would be my my destination of choice. And then followed by Iceland. I really, really, really want to go to Iceland. I'd pick Japan. It, You know, mine was Japan for the longest time. But now that I'm older, I'm like, you know, I it's not there anymore. Like My love for Japan just isn't as strong as it used to be. And I think the reason why is because... Uh... Like Tokyo being so like future driven and like hard surface and then but then it could go like across the island and then it could just be like farmlands and mountains and stuff. I think that's why I would choose Japan. Hmm. Uh, Dave T wants to know uh where do you concentrate when working on this orange? <laughs> that was a good one. That took me a second because I was drawing and I was like, I was literally thinking of where do I concentrate? Yeah. Well played, uh, sir. sir <laughs> well played. Ellie Watkins says, I find all of these puns pretty appealing. Oh, I get it. Uh, Mika wants to know, have you seen the new Daredevil show? I have not, but I, I actually will. Normally, I'm not um, like huge fan of superhero stuff, but 
I really trust Netflix. I loved House of Cards. I thought Orange is the New Black was amazing. So I'm an unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which I wanted to not like, and I ended up liking. So yes, I will watch the new Daredevil with admittedly a high reserve <laughs> like level of what I'm expecting is probably higher than it should be, but I, I trust Netflix, so I, I'm curious to see what it's like. I'm interested to see what they do with it. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, I'm Matt says, is it a good idea to make one of those repaints of something you did a few years ago uh, kind of artworks? Yeah. I think as long as you're not like investing a month into it. Yeah. I, I always think those are, you know what? M maybe it's because I, I find personal satisfaction in doing those where it's like, they're not necessary. Like, you know, you've grown as an artist, but I think sometimes just to physically see it rather than mentally know it. Uh, I think those are what those draw me again. Memes are kind of for is just for like a, a clarification of yes, I've gotten better <laughs> kind of a thing. And just like, it's cool for other people to see your progress too. Cause sometimes you might know it, but maybe someone that's following you doesn't see it as clearly. So it, it's kind of cool then be like, uh, here's something I was really proud of a couple of years ago. Here's how much uh, I've grown since then. Okay. You want to do a last final look over a question you might want to do? Hi. Right. Let me do a final look over. <laughs> um, someone says, you're awesome. I always leave these live streams with a better understanding of visual art in general. Thanks, Sim. Well, thank you, Adam, for coming to these live streams. That's why we do these. Um, have I ever thought of being ambidextrous? I wish I could be. I just don't think I have the time or patience. But if I was forced to, I would give it my all to learn how to draw left-handed. Um, oh, this is kind of neat. Have you ever drawn something with a mathematical theme? Uh, no, but I'm very curious in it, especially after finding out what the word filigree meant and the, the, the pattern and design of that and how it's actually the whatever that curve is, that infinite curve, where technically that is math related. Maybe that's why I'm so visually intrigued by it. So yeah, I think that'd be something cool to tackle sometime. <laughs> Your fruit puns are unparable. Um, all right, so here's a legit question of, if I would start drawing digitally right now at this very second, could I become as good as you in four years? And what would be your advice and motivation for keeping the fire and not giving up? All right, you should be, you should, if you're going to make the transition of doing digital, I don't want you to look at it so much of, I have four years to get good because you're gonna be crunching a lot of time that someone like myself or another artist that has been doing this probably their entire life, they have so much more years and not only an experience, but their visual eye has been trained and they have a, a hand-eye coordination, they have a muscle memory to it. And there's a lot more going on with the artist that has been doing it on a longer time. I do think you can, yes, you can get if you set a goal for yourself, you can definitely achieve it. But just know if you're crunching a short amount of time, you're going to have to do a lot more work and you're going to have to really push yourself. But yes, I think it's doable. And to not, how to keep that fire going, is to not let petty things get you discouraged. Like things like posting your art and then not getting any likes or comments on it, that, that might happen. And I think for you just be like, okay, you know, Tim said this was going to happen. You know, I'm going to keep that in the back of my mind so that, you know, in a couple months from now, maybe I'll start getting a few likes. And then in a year from now, maybe I'll start getting double digits and it'll, just, it'll, it'll build on itself. It has a snowball effect to it. All right, let's see here. Oop, accidentally closed it out. There we go. Um, I'm not actually, I don't know what this is design lab like cynics is. Do you know what that is, Joe? Yeah, it, he does. Uh, he'll take, it's kind of like a, an exercise, but he does it over the course of maybe like a couple of episodes on YouTube. Oh, okay. Then I guess that's kind of what our exercises are. 
<laughs> Can you draw while tapping your feet? Right now, I'm literally... I don't know if you guys have that nervous twitch, or I don't know what this is considered, where you're always, like, uh, jumping your leg, or you're, you know, you're constantly jittering your leg. So, yes, I, I do feel like I could tap my feet and draw at the same time, because I'm, I'm always tapping my leg anyways. Oh, man, there's a lot of questions today, guys. Thank you. These are all very serious, too. Okay, I think we're good. Oh, someone said they love Face Off, but since they live in Denmark, they have to wait to see it online. All right, well, next week, if you're able to see it, I want to hear if you thought the winner deserved it or not. Someone says practice, practice, and takes risks. Yes, yes, yes. That's good, good, good. Oh my god, the scroll thing never stops. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Like, like, okay, we're almost at the bottom, and then it, like, it refreshes, and it goes like back to the middle. Yeah. All right, I think we're going to end it now. Uh, these are really good questions, so if you uh, felt it wasn't answered, feel free to come to our live stream next week and ask it then. And I'm, we'll, we'll, We try to get as many in as we can in the hour and a half, sometimes a little more that we uh, do these live streams in. So... Uh, final announcements. Thank you guys. Uh, check out the new brush pack that will be most likely available on Friday. And if you really have a suggestion and you want that brush to be made, please drop me a message somewhere, either on our DeviantArt, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, whatever account, and I'm sure I'll get it and I'll try to make it if it, it seems like a reasonable, good brush to add to the collection. Uh, we're looking to add, I think, two more I guess I don't want to set ourselves up for failure, but we're looking to record uh, some tutorials. Joe's going to be tackling his first tutorial, and that will be out in about three weeks, most likely. Yeah. And we finally have yeah, and we finally have our book review station ready to record. So that will probably be recorded on Friday. So I know for some of those, there's been at least one person that has asked me why haven't you done the Final Fantasy 14 book review? It's coming, I promise. And yeah, those are the big announcements. And I think we might start be getting into photo reference uh, photos. So uh, we're going to do a test batch with an emotion sheet. And um, I'm going to hire some of my little cousins to do some expressions. And if this is something that interests you, let us know, because that might give us more incentive to make more, or if it's something that, you can de that we feel is a good asset to have on the site. All right, any final words, Joe? Uh, no, you actually hit everything that I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah do exercise 39 guys i'm looking forward to seeing what you guys uh pump out yeah actually the last one that was like this the berries i felt like some of you like did you set me up for you're like okay tim this is this is how well i can do and i was like damn those are some really good berries i gotta really push myself to do better than that and i felt like some of you still did better than me on the last exercise so it'll be exciting to see if you can beat me on the fruit challenge so we'll see all right I'm done. Thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next Wednesday. Right. Bye. Bye.